Hi, everyone, and welcome. We'll let people continue to trickle in from the waiting room. Hello. Welcome everyone from Ensemble Evolution here on the Zoom meeting. And for those tuning in on YouTube, my name is Bridget Bergen, Production and Communications Manager for International Contemporary Ensemble. We are so, so grateful and excited to have this panel talk focused on the freedom of creativity in black spaces with Katie Brown, Clifton Joey Guidry III, and Zelaney Harris. Unfortunately, the composer, drummer, scholar, amazing musician, Jesse Cox, is not able to join us today, but we'll still hear um, about some of his work as well as um, like a performance video. There will be time at the end for a Q&A discussion with everyone here on Zoom. So please feel free to put your questions in the chat box throughout our time together. Um, but right now, let's start by hearing more about Katie, Delaney, and Joey. Katie Brown is a violist hailing from Evanston, Illinois. She's a graduate of the Eastman School of Music where she studied viola performance and music education. She studied viola with George Taylor. Katie received her degree in music education from Illinois State University where she studied viola with Dr. Catherine Lewis. Katie has performed, given lectures and lecture recitals in cities around the world, including Wellington, Poznan, Seoul, Nashville, and Salt Lake City. An adv advocate for access to quality music education for aspiring musicians of all backgrounds, Katie teaches in the El Sistema inspired programs, rock music and Bravo Buddies. Aside from playing and teaching, Katie is co-host of Classically Black Podcast, a classical music podcast that discusses classical music from the Black perspective, which I, I think we're going to hear more about that podcast as well during our time together today. Um, and finally, Katie is currently a fellow with the Memphis Symphony Orchestra. Hi, Katie, and thank you for, for being here today. Hi, thanks for having me. Delaney Harris is a double bassist and podcaster from Los Angeles, California. She began her musical studies with piano at age seven and later switched to double bass at age 12. She has played in orchestras all over Los Angeles, including the Inner City Youth Orchestra of Los Angeles and the Los Angeles Philharmonics Youth Orchestra. A graduate of the Eastman School of Music, Harris is a fierce advocate for equity and cultural inclusivity in classical music spaces. In November 2018, Harris co-founded Classically Black Podcast, which brings listeners into the world of classical music through the eyes of Black classical musicians with a new and interesting twist. Harris has hosted and presented at conferences promoting equity and inclusion for Black musicians across the country, including Sphinx Connect, the Yola National Symposium, and the El Sistema USA National Symposium. Hi, Delaney. Thank you for being here. Thank you so much for having me. Radical self-love, compassion, laughter, and the drive to amplify Black art makers and noisemakers comprise the core of Joy Guidry's work. The New York City bassoonist, composer, and activist excels in many spheres. The San Diego Tribune hails their performances as lyrical and haunting, hair-raising, and unsettling. Joey is not simply an acclaimed bassoonist, rather they are also a versatile improviser and a composer of experimental and daring new works that embody a deep love of storytelling. Joey's compositions channel their inner child in honor of their ancestors and predecessors. In every aspect of their practice, Joey seeks to support, hire, and promote Black artists. In support of this mandate, Joey has spearheaded Sounds of the African Diaspora, a competition and commissioning platform for composers from the African diaspora. This new initiative ensures that composers from the diaspora have access to the space, resources, and time necessary to foster new innovative music. Joey holds a bachelor's degree in bassoon performance from the Peabody Conservatory and a graduate performance diploma from the Manus School of Music. They have attended and been featured by such prestigious festivals as the Spoleto Festival USA and the Banff Center for Arts and Creativity. And I should note that Joey has participated 
in Ensemble Evolution in the past at Banff, as well as last year when we um, began our partnership with the new school's College of Performing Arts in a virtual setting. And here we are doing it in a virtual setting again this year. So thank you, Joey, for bringing everyone together for this discussion today. And I'll let you take it away from here. Hey, y'all. Um, so yeah, we're going to cover a lot of ground today. Um, but what we're really going to focus on is what it's like to be a Black artist today in out like in classical and contemporary in the way that like we're kind of unfortunately not so much bound to institutions, but since they hold so much power and resources, like how do you navigate that while still staying true to your um, to your mission, to our mission? Um, also, just like collaborating with me and Jesse in this new concerto that we're working on and Katie and Delaney, our co-founders of Classically Black Podcast and the International Society of Black Musicians, which I'm very grateful to be on the board with them for that. Um, so yeah, we're gonna cover all of that. Um, so yeah, Katie and Delaney, um, whoever wants to go first, how do you, how do you feel you show up to a space that is not fully representative of you compared to when it's an all black space as an artist, as a person? Um, I guess I can go first since I'm already muted, but um, I think it certainly hasn't been like a, a overnight process for me, but I would say for the most part, I show up as Katie to every space that I'm at, that I uh, go to, whether it's black or all white or mixed spaces. Um, so my my background, like I went to a suburban high school, so I guess it was pretty diverse or as diverse as a suburban high school can be. But like in in that space, like I took a straight honors classes, I took straight APs one time, do not recommend, it was terrible. And like I was the only black person in those spaces. I also was the only black person in, in my orchestra, like period, because I was in, all my friends were in the string orchestra, but I was in the symphony orchestra. And so I was the only black person there. So I, so in that, during that time, like I often would like put on my white voice or like try to make myself more palatable. And it just got really exhausting, like really exhausting really quickly. So by the time I got to undergrad, I kind of was like, yeah, I'm just not gonna code switch anymore. I'm just not gonna do it. So as, at, when I made that, when I made that decision, like through undergrad, I was practicing like just showing up to spaces as my authentic self as much as possible. So now, like when I met you, when I met Delaney, when I got to Eastman, like I was like, all right, what are we doing? Like we lit, like, you know what I'm saying? Like I was always trying to be myself and it's not always easy. I'm not gonna say it is, but, and my authentic self is not like a black caricature. It's just like, it's just my personality. Like I just show up how I am. And I think what I practice more, um, especially like these days where I, I kind of live like in a, I would say like I created my own experience at Eastman. Like I didn't, I didn't talk to like any white people like in class and stuff, of course. But like I went to like an HBCU in my head because my friends were black, my teacher was black, like my one of my music edu education professors was black. So I literally like was in my own little world. And what I practiced um, then was like just time and place. Like even though my black my my VO teacher was black, I didn't go to lessons. Like yo, what up? Bro? What we doing though? You know what I'm saying? I was I was like hi. Let's play viola because that's what I was there to do. You know, so now that I'm in a different space um, where where that has changed, kind of like back to like the kind of the reality um, at the University of Memphis as well as with the Memphis Symphony Orchestra, I practice the same thing. I show up as Katie, like when I talk to when I talk to the to the principal violist, asking a question, I don't change my voice. When I'm in lessons, I don't change my voice when I give comments to studio, like I say it as Katie. So I, it's been a long, a long journey, but uh, as, to answer your question, like I don't, I don't, I show up as myself to every space that I'm in, whether I'm talking to my sorority sisters, whether I am on Classically Black, whether I'm in a lesson, in a viola lesson, like I just try to show up as my authentic self because it's just way more damaging not to. And um, I, had, I had to learn that uh, over time. Yeah, I too would say it's been a journey, especially going to college. Um, 
I grew up in a very like all black space. My my schools, mostly my um, my neighborhood I grew up in, my church, everything was black. Even the orchestra that well, one of the orchestras I was in was was pretty much all black. Um, and so I had been used to code switching, but I didn't have to code switch a lot because I was in black spaces pretty much all the time. So then I thought, you know, it'll be that, but just longer when I went to college. But I realized that that was not sustainable. Like it got to the point where just like I could feel when I was alone, like a weight lifted off my shoulders because I didn't feel like I need to do that anymore. And I didn't realize how how subconscious that was. Um, so it's been a journey on doing that. Um, and like Katie said, she decided she would just wasn't going to do it. And it had literally never occurred to me to just stop. You know, like it was very it was very second nature. But, um, you know, I've. I've definitely um, gotten there. But one thing I would say um, that kind of goes to how I show up in um, in like white spaces or mixed spaces, especially in classical music, um, that also relates to us being kind of beholden to certain institutions, um, is that a lot of the time thinking about my future, I, I show up with a lot of anxiety. Um, and the reason is because in order to to operate in classical music, even like in academia or in the professional world as our authentic selves, if you want to study anything outside of like what is considered like Western classical music, um, you either there's not a lot of options, I would say, and you kind of have to be the person that is perfect so that you can have your pick of whatever and as we know like going to music school is hard going to any type of school is hard and not everybody is coming out on the other side of that with the perfect grades or the perfect whatever like that you need to um to access any to have your pick of any institution that you want to study in so the few institutions that do prioritize studying our music and do have black professors and do have you know the options for you to actually make the most of your time there um there's so few of them that you kind of like, if you want to dedicate your time to that, um, and you don't want to waste your time doing things that you know you don't want to do, then you kind of have to be, um, you know, be on your P's and Q's while other institutions can just kind of slack and like not really um, uh, allocate any resources um, to, to black music or to anything that kind of enriches the experience of, of um, students. This has been in the forefront of my mind because I'm obviously, you know, I'm thinking about grad school and it is, it's, I, I frankly don't wanna go anywhere where I can't, you know, have a black advisor or, or at least, at least one black professor. And that just totally rules out a lot. <laughs> For me and I, I don't know if um, I mean y'all have both been to grad school so I don't know what your experience has been in um, in picking and choosing which institutions to give your time and your money to um, but I think that that's really been at the forefront of my mind thinking about where I want to invest the the next couple years of my life yeah I agree about the view it's it is a journey and it's kind of I don't say never ending but yeah, Katie, I mean, I tell you all the time, like you saying um, that you don't code switch anymore when we were doing the LA Phil thing, like immediately changed me. And it made me realize like, wow, I've been talking like this forever when I'm a country ass bitch, you know? So, <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't make sense. And I would show up to orchestra and like, orchestra is so stupid in the way of, if I'm I come from my bag. Well. Yeah, I know exactly. <laughs> but like, it's it's just the system of it. Like, if you're a second bassoonist and you have a question, technically, you're not allowed to ask the question. You have to turn to the principal. Our ancestors fought too much for that shit. So you know, it's it's ridiculous that the systems in place are just so oppressive in such smaller ways. You know, um, and I feel like in academia, it really does force us into that box a lot. And kind of like you, Delaney, I grew up in East side of Houston. I grew up with um, all black people, Latinx people and South Asians. So my upbringing was very different than a lot of people that I ended up going to school with uh, when it came to demographics. When I got to Peabody, I, I, I just did not know it would be what it was like. And it kind of was like that in my studio because I wanted to play more contemporary music my later 
um, years there and my teacher was like, oh, you got to play all your skills all the time. You have to do this technique, this technique, and this technique. And I'm like, like, I kind of see where you're going, but on um, bassoon, if you're playing in the tenor range from F sharp to B or even E flat, um, and you're doing these multiphonics, it's going to get your ass in tune. You know, you need to hear the chord. And then when I go back and do my long tones, the F sharp is there. You have to practice the control um, to play an F to sync into the multiphonic and still have the F present and come back up and it's still in tune. You know, it's like the pedagogy is ruins white supremacy, the musicology is ruins white supremacy. Um, it's everything about it is really messed up at the fundamental. Um, but we can't be surprised because it was not created for us in mind. I mean, most of these schools were only created for white men. Um, to me, you know, it's going to be like a real fucked up place when they don't even include all their white people. That white on white crime is loud, you know? So it, it is really discouraging. But, you know, with grad school, and like you said, trying to decide where you spend your time and money, um, when I was at Manus for a bassoon, honestly, like, it was pretty cool. Um, I studied with Rebecca, who was here. It was a great time. She kicked my ass. Um, but, you know, I ended up having an incident there and with a librarian, and he racially harassed me and assaulted me, you know, in the school that prides itself on the theme of new school being like rah 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 you know and then they said I was lying you know it's like okay it's not adding up it's not giving what it was supposed to give so it really it's disappointing because it's like is there a true structure that is going to protect black people that's not just going to send out these emails of like oh well this is what we're doing now to protect all of our POC students they don't even you know we don't differentiate that we all have different struggles as people of color and black and indigenous people. So um, it is really, really wild. But now I study with uh, Jesse Montgomery and it is incredible, you know, like just going into the lesson with this black woman and just, there is no weight on my shoulders. We just kiki and we get it done. In the fall, I was with Monica Ellis. You know, I just showed up when we played, there was just no, language barrier you know like it just you just show up and get to be who you are and that's the important part of these institutions and that's the you know really what i want you to bring y'all here today to really talk about is just what is our ideal institution look like you know where do we get the funding can we build our own institution without the support of existing institutions you know um, or do we just take their money and run so we have, you know, again, so much to cover, but before we really dive into everything, I wanted to play this track by Blood Orange um, that really kind of inspired this talk. So like my favorite images are the ones where someone who isn't supposed to be there who's like in a space, a space where we were not ever welcomed in, where we were not invited. Yet we walk in and we show all the way up. People try to put us down by saying, she's doing the most or he's way too much. But like, why would we want to do the least? And that's Janet Mock, you know, the Black trans woman, talking about that. And it's just so important that we get to show up and be ourselves. And I feel like we do that. You know, we can try our best to do that. But if the space doesn't allow to do that, you know, it's, it's, I feel like it even puts more stress in our body because we're like, well, damn, we're showing up, we're being ourselves. And you really don't want us. You do want us to fit into that box. You, you want to be comfortable. You don't want us to be comfortable. So why have us there? You know, like, it's kind of, everyone deserves to be in a space, you know, all black people deserve to be in a space that they truly want to be. If one of our friends wanted to go sing in the Met, they damn well deserve to go sing in the Met, you know? But if they're gonna keep doing yellow face, if they're gonna keep doing black face with Aida, 
just admit your racism and just have whites only at this point. You know what I mean? Like if you, if this organ, if an organization is not committed to just being better, stop bringing black people, stop bringing um, East Asian, all people that aren't white into your space to be traumatized just so you can get more money from the Mellon Foundation, you know? So with all of that and creating spaces, I would love if y'all could talk about your podcast and how you amplify Black voices. Yeah, that's why, that's why I feel like we all have our, our roles in this journey. There are some people who really, you know, like you said, want to sing at the Met. They want to go and, um, and fight through that and, you know, fight the good fight. But one thing about me, I'm not going to beg you. So if I see, if I feel like I'm not welcome here, I don't want to be here. Um, and I feel like that's kind of um, what has gone into us creating Classically Black is a space that we have created with people like us in mind. And I feel like, you know, it's it's a little early to be tired, but at the same time, it's like, I've, um, I've been like, you know what? I feel like I am not going to see the end of this in my lifetime. And I would much rather focus on uplifting um, the Black people who are, are here right now and creating a space for us to just rest and feel great and feel uplifted. Um, and of course, we do have heavy conversations on Classically Black. Um, we have serious conversations sometimes, but a lot of it is, you know, kicking and, and being fun and, and uh, really lightening up something that a lot of people take too seriously. I feel like a lot of people it's weird. I feel like with music, some people like take it simultaneously, don't take it seriously enough, but also take it too seriously. I think it depends on what type of music you're talking about, but that's another conversation. Um, but that kind of is why, or not even is why, but is one of the results of uh, Classically Black um, is just kind of creating a space for Black musicians to feel seen. I can't tell you how many times we've gotten messages from people who are like, man, I really relate to y'all. I really relate to something that y'all said or one of your guests or something like that. Um, and it's a completely independent project. You know, um, Katie and I don't answer to anybody. So um, with that, that kind of gives us that creativity in it because Classically Black is a Black space and we are able to do whatever we want. And if someone does not want to sponsor us or or um, or work with us because of that, then that's fine because we run Classically Black. Um, and it's been very, um, that's been very freeing and very um, important because, you know, we've heard from people who who didn't necessarily have that freedom and have gotten calls because they have someone to answer to because of something that they said or something that their producer or such and such would rather them not say. Um, and I think that kind of uh, goes into why a lot of people will say, oh, classically Black is something different that we haven't heard in classical music, because in a lot of places in classical music, people are not Black people specifically are not speaking freely because they are beholden to to other institutions. And that's not to say that Katie and I are not in some ways. Obviously, we both have jobs and, and things like that. But also, classical Black is a public thing and anybody who hires us know, you know, they know what they're getting into. So, <laughs> um, so I think it's, it, that's been really important uh, to me is kind of having that autonomy over what we put out. Yeah, I think Delaney made a good point about the like toggling between like should you should you be in a space that is not welcoming to you, but also one thing that I've been going back and forth about, especially like on this um, orchestral route, is that sometimes I just feel like I I believe that Black people should take up space because I feel like we 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 built so much of this and we just have to take what's ours. And I mean, obviously there are, there are levels to that because I think it's just really toxic to be in a space that you're not welcome in at all. Like that's just not, you have to balance, you have, it has to be a balance of like, like sending your kids to like an all white public, like all white private school, you know, it's like, it's like that kind of thing where like the education be good, but it'll be really damaging, potentially probably really damaging. Um, so I find myself juggling between like taking up space in the symphonic world because I believe that black people should be taking up space, but also black people having autonomy to create their own things. But then also black people shouldn't have to create their own things. So it's like really like this weird like like circular thing. It's it's just really complex and it, it can't really be whittled down into like one single statement or several statements because it's just like 
like Delaney said, like everybody has their position to fight. Not everybody wants to fight. And black people shouldn't have to fight, but also black people should take up space as well. And that's the cool thing about um, Class Two Black. I think also in my personal evolution over the two and a half years that we've been doing it is, is like being more and more open about what, what I personally say on Class Two Black because I feel like at the beginning, I found myself really talking around certain things, but now, like, I mean, sometimes I do say stuff, I'll be like, yeah, I'm gonna take that out. But, <laughs> but other times, like, for, for the most part, I would say, like, 90% of the time, like I said what I said, because classical, classical institutions or white institutions, they want to look like they're doing something. And that's, like, the thing that I found to be really frustrating through classically black and taking a closer look at, like, why are we talking about this stuff? Like, why is this stuff happening in 2018 and 2020 and 2021? Like, why is this stuff happening? And you realize that these institutions want to make it look like they're doing something. Like, they want to make it look, we have 8% black people at our institution. Oh, we have a BSU. They want, they want to have black people in their spaces without catering to their blackness. And this is a whole, like, part of, of making it look like they're being productive so i think when we well for me personally like calling that behavior out because i think it's just really like it's just it's just like a uh, smoke and mirrors you know so like my alma mater East, eastman is a great example of this they're not on the spectrum they're not all the way on on just make on solely making it look like they're doing a good job like they're then I, I would not personally say that However, like my experience was a little bit different. Like I said, I live in like kind of like a euphoric state when I was at Eastman. Um, but um, I will say like they're, they're a prime example of that idea of making it look like they're doing a really fantastic job, but like not really doing everything that they should be doing or even can be doing to, to make it better. So um, yeah, this idea of like black people should take up space take what's theirs, but also not have to fight if they don't want to and shouldn't have to. It's just really, it's a really complex, um, circular conversation. Yeah. I mean, we deserve freedom always, you know, and exactly like people should not have to fight, but us just existing is fighting, you know, us existing is the whole, like, when people say like, take the politics out of your art or some shit like that. And it's like, you made us political, you know, like we did not last time I checked, like, I didn't ask for this, you know, um, and my little brother, he, you know, bless his heart, but he asked me when I was home, he was like, Joey, what is racism? And I was like, what do you mean? You know, and he was like, I don't get it. Like, why don't they like me? And I was like, well, um, you know, yeah, exactly. I was like, uh, you have darker skin. That's literally it. That is the root of it. I don't know what else to tell you. And he was very sad, you know. Um, and, but he brought up um, the gymnastics team, and sh I believe her name is Shakari, the track, the 100 meter. You know, he brought them up, and he was just like, "But we're the best." And I was like, "You know, keep that thinking in mind." And it just, when I think about blackness and just existing, but always trying to get cut down. I really have been thinking about Simone Biles these last couple of weeks, because I mean, she is everywhere. And also the way white people use goat now at all the time, I'm like, this is, this is kind of a lot, but she cannot be topped, you know? Like it's impossible. They've had to lower her scores because other people cannot do what she does. And it's, it's absolutely insane how this powerful Black woman has shown up to this space, literally leaping over shit, you know, and just reaching bounds and breaking ceilings and still, and still because white people cannot do the flips that she can do, they are lowering her ability, you know? And it's at that point, that's when it kind of clicked for me, like, oh, we need our own Black Olympics, you know, like at this point, God damn it, because like, what else is there to be done? You also saw well, how like, quick they I, were to cut her down when she fell off the beam. Exactly. Like, like literally has never fallen off. She is the anything. Beam. And literally fell off the beam and they, and that's why I, I was gonna, I'm not gonna say too much about this because I was gonna talk to Tony about something. But um, the idea of like black people taking up space in these, in these spaces and then they change the rules 
Like that, that is actually disgusting. Simone will do like all these flips. I've, I've been paying a lot of attention. I've been paying a lot of attention. She do all these flips that people have never done before. Things that only men have attempted. And now they don't want people to attempt it because it's dangerous. It wasn't dangerous for her when she attempted the first time. And now she's getting, she does all this stuff and gets like a 14, like 14 points for like defying gravity. And then she <laughs> fell off the beam. She fell off the beam and it's like, oh, fall off the beam again if you want to. What? And that's like, I feel like these conversations with blackness and white spaces happen like we literally gymnastics classical music dentistry it's all the same it's all the same stuff that's happening that's happening everywhere it's like oh misty copeland she's not even that good she's not she's not okay like it's the same it's, we're all having the same conversation we just all sit down all the black people in these spaces just all sit down and have a conversation because we're all experiencing the same things just through different mediums about rule changing goalposts moving like waiting for us to mess up it's just like this is really toxic. Yeah. And I think the thing that is missed so much with these institutions, they see us. I mean, the three of us, Garrett, Jess, um, Alex, you know, Alex Lang, so many other people. I feel like when we get asked to do things like this and people are shocked with what we're saying, I'm like, well, God damn it, at this point, are you doing your research? You know, because um, every Black person speaks differently, but, you know, we kind of take a different approach to ours. But I really wish institutions understood, like, I don't have a ton of faith in them anymore. But if I get on the internet and call you out or call a person out, it's because you have left us to no other resort. You know, when people now have to go, like that um, young student at Eastman with the flute, the flute major, if he believed that he would have been believed and not possibly murdered, by those security guards. I mean, I don't know if they hold weapons at University of Rochester, but they could. Um, he wouldn't have to go on Instagram live or post a video, you know, like we have to do things to protect ourselves, but then we're labeled as troublemakers. This happens to so, so many black artists, so many indigenous artists, so many Latinx artists, you know. Um, there, oof, it was someone in Texas a couple years ago but this young Latinx woman gave a speech about how she was undocumented and this white lady called ICE, you know, like it's just, it's- that happened on Triloquy, on Garrett's podcast. Yes, he had a, um, yes, a bazoonist on there and who, who talked about his, his immigration story and somebody called ICE on him. Yeah, and it just, it's so heartbreaking at the end of the day. Um, and, you know, with spaces and everything also with, International Society of Black Musicians, you know, y'all's child, we talk a lot about tables and many Black conversations and many DEI conversations and everything. So do you want more Black people at these tables that weren't created for us? Because, you know, agree with you on taking up space. Um, or should we just be making our own tables at this point? Like, are these institutions able to be saved or we just make our own shit? Or both, you know. I don't think there is like a correct answer here. Well, I think, I mean, one thing I wanted to say about this quickly about the last um, conversation about the whole Simone Biles thing and like, um, I, it's just because this really pertains to something I think a lot of when it comes to music is like a lot of people don't give us that freedom of creativity um, because they cannot. They try to comprehend blackness within a, a the scale or the parameters that they know in their mind it's not so it's not just like an open-minded thing it's like well this is what we know people can do and Simone Biles did something outside of that so let's just try to squeeze that into the you know what we've been doing when it's like no she is pushing the boundaries she is the blueprint like <laughs> you need to catch up with her not the other way around um and I think that I mean that's super relevant to to you know, contemporary music, especially because there's so much innovation and um, and so many boundaries being pushed um, in that space that a lot of people are just not receptive to. Even if it's not your cup of tea, they're still just like, nope, like that's not music or whatever. And that's really a pet peeve of mine. But to your question, I mean, do I want black people at these tables that weren't made for us? I want that for the black people that want that. It's not what I want for myself, but I want that for the black people that want that, you know, um, because I think that um, anyone who has the the strength and the resiliency um, and the actual 
true desire um, and not to strengthen the resiliency because they have to have it, but because that's something that they truly want for themselves. Um, then I want that for them, but I don't want them to feel like, dang, I really want this and I'm conflicted about it. So I guess I got to suffer through it because that's something that I've really, I think Katie and I have talked about this, something that I really see in like our parents' generation where like just the way that we talk about stuff is completely flipped. Like my mom was like, well, you already know you got to go through this, this and that, like, that's just the way it is. So you might as well do this. And I'm like, no, but I'm saying they shouldn't be treating me that way. So I'm not going to I'm not going to uh, um, partake in whatever this opportunity or situation is until I'm treated with with respect um, and et cetera. But she's like, well, you already know you're not going to be treated with respect, so you might as well do this and this and that to counteract that. Um, and, I, and I've it, it's just crazy because it's very it's sad to see the ways that like the people that have raised or shaped us have been beaten into submission for, for, uh, in, in a lot of ways um, to the point where they view a lot of these um, a lot of this oppression as inevitable and um, just simply something that you must tolerate and like the the fact that it should not exist or not that should not exist that it cannot exist for for their children is like they cannot comprehend that it's just something that like they they have taken as a given um and that's one of the reasons why i don't want you know necessarily uh, to be at those tables myself um but i also like katie said don't believe and don't tell any black person that asked me about classically black or isbm to to make their own things like that's not something that i say i'll be like i made this but i don't think i'm not going to tell you to make anything because you shouldn't have to do that um, and I'm not going to tell you that the only way to um, fulfill your your dreams and your career um, is to build your own stuff, because that is an added burden that so many of your colleagues will never have. Um, and you should not be expected to to perform um, in tip top shape like everyone else on top of having to build yourself the foundation and then the pedestal and, and catch up and make up for all of the all of the um, systemic um, barriers that have been placed at literally every single step of the way. Because you see in, in classical music especially, we have so many initiatives and things at every little, every rung on the ladder, really. Um, and some of which don't work because they don't really I guess connect with the ones on the rung below or above it. That's another thing. But um, we see that the fact that we need these initiatives at every step of the way, it should tell people that there are black people having to build themselves up every step of the way, in addition to how difficult it is to be a, a, a musician outside of that. Like even just with no barriers, it's still just a ton of hard work. And anybody, and that's why so many white people who are in these positions who may have had all this access really feel like, dang, I worked hard and, and, and nah, it wasn't easy for me and, and et cetera, et cetera, because being a musician is not easy. But um, it's very clear that that because black, black people were not in mind um, in the, actually, I, I, tr I struggle to say whether or not they were in mind. They were in mind, but in the part of the mind that says, keep them away from here, so you know um but because of that that's the reason why um it's it's just so much harder for us to to get to that place Katie yeah I, I remember when I was my last year at Eastman so a personnel um member, I, don't, I don't remember who from the San Francisco Symphony came to give a talk um, and someone in the audience, I don't know if it was ill intent or just ignorance, um, was like, well, there's always issues with like black people being in orchestras. Like, why don't you guys just make your own orchestra? And it's like, you don't see the reason, you don't see that that's a complete, one, completely inappropriate. And two, like, we should not have to do that. Like, that is absolutely ridiculous. And the people that you, um, that you have seen make a make an all black whatever ensemble whatever the Ritz Charlton, oh the Ritz Chamber Players, <laughs> the Ritz Carlton is a hotel. The Ritz Chamber Players, um, the uh, the Gateway Music Festival and another festival that I won't name. Um, when you see these people making making these places, they do that out of necessity, 
um, but we should not have to to do that. So, um, as I said before, also I'm, I the more I go through classical music, the more I realize that like I'm just a firm believer in people not have to get in out the mud to get to be successful in this in this field. I mean, I of course classical music is a lot of work. Like um, everyone uh, knows that. So that that is in classical music knows that it's a lot of work. However, I think like some of like the like my teacher being called the hard R at Aspen, like that kind of stuff. Like you should just not have to make it out the mud. And um, so I believe in that, but I like, I, I, I'll echo what I said before. I think the people who want to be in those spaces, I am people, um, you know, should be able to do that um, with with an ease, um, just like my white colleagues, you know, besides I, I should be able to focus on playing well. And for the most part, I'm not going to because every time I say for the most part, literally like a year later, like something comes up <laughs> that that uh, takes that sentiment away. But for the most part, I think um, I've had it okay. Um, yeah. Not, it hasn't been, there's been stuff, but like I haven't had like um, terrible like news, newsworthy material uh, that, that goes outside of a lot of my black colleagues besides like, you know, your everyday racism. Um, I hope to, that it stays that way without the everyday racism. But like I said, people people should be able to, black people should be able to take up space if they want to um, or create if they want to, but should not have to create. Yeah. And with Chenike, um, you know, an amazing black orchestra in London. London? Yeah. Um, Anna Nikiko Myers, is that the violinist name? Um, came out and was like, this is racism. Why do y'all need this? And times like, at what point are you gonna decide to let us in or not let us in? You know, and um, I've said this a couple of times before, and you know, I still stand by it. Like, um, most of my life has been orchestra. Um, I started, I started playing saxophone, and then so I didn't win band, um, and then I got to college and switched to bassoon. Um, so then I started playing in orchestra, and I was like, wow, this is like pretty racist. Um, and then it got very racist. Um, but there was no lie about it, you know, like there was no, I don't think anyone was trying to hide this. And that's the problem with um, contemporary spaces. Oftentimes it's, they try to create the facade that things are okay, kind of like universities and things like this. And there's not enough accountability. And I really wish that a lot of contemporary ensembles and contemporary organizations, spaces, we just accept like you are white. So in fact, you have either overt or internal, well, definitely internalized racism, but, um, and all of these things and just start to work on the process so we can feel comfortable in every space because I mean, yes, we should absolutely be able to take over every space. But you know, again, the question is at what cost, like at what amount of violence are we gonna have to take from doing this? And I completely agree, Katie or Delaney, like everyone, you know, with things I've created too, I'm like, you should not have to do this, you know, like you should just be able to work and just go to school. Every black student is a double major in college. They are majoring in their instrument and they are majoring in survival. So um, at the end, I think it was my last year, me and my professor had a real good heart to heart, you know, that post pre-graduation talk. And he was just telling me, like, you were always so tired, even though he was like, because of me being tired. But he was always like, you're always so tired. Like, what's going on? And I was like, I wake up and I have to look at the news um, and see what's going on. I'm worried about my little brother. You know, I'm worried about my mental health and then school. And then you want me to memorize three Vivaldi can charity this week. You know, like, we have to realize that Black students go through so much more. I mean, it's, you know, they used to say, they still say black people have worked twice as hard to have what as half of white people has, but it's eight times. It's eight times as hard. And you mentioned it earlier, Delaney, like we have to be ridiculously good at whatever we do to enter these spaces, you know? And then when we get there, we're ridiculed, we're put under this microscope. You do one thing wrong, they never give you an opportunity again. And it's, it's incredibly frustrating. And the people's... Um, Black musicians who do orchestra, their process of getting tenure compared to their white counterparts. Sometimes it takes years for Black people to get tenure to where it can be three concerts or just one season or half a season for a white orchestra member and they 
in fact, then get tenure. Um, but with that and like spaces and everything and with ISBM, um, why is ISBM not for people of color and why is it specifically for Black people? Glad you asked, because that was something I, um, I uh, put a, put down. Well, first, somebody in the, the chat asked, what is the hard R? That's the N word with the E-R and not the A, um, is what Katie was referring to. Um, but this kind of goes into what you were talking about with Chinake and Anna Kiko Myers, because what she said was, I wonder, do you have to be Black to solo with this orchestra? And I remember I was talking about this on Class of Black, and Katie was like, yeah, <laughs> yeah, girl, you do. <laughs> And there's nothing wrong with it. And um, you brought up ISBN, but also this, is, I can't tell you, this has come up with Classically Black as well. Some people are like, are you ever gonna open up Classically Black to Classically People of Color podcast? And are you ever gonna have this person on? And and I remember, and we you know, thought through it. And I remember just being like the day that we have somebody who's not black on Classically Black is the day that we can't find any black person on the face of the earth to talk about that. And that's just, that's just never gonna happen. Cause a lot of people will see something like Classically Black or they see something like ISBM and they see that we're catering specifically to black musicians and be like, well, don't you wanna open it up? That's the, that's the main thing. When everyone sees something that is for black people, they equate opening it up to other people as uh, to making it better. They're like, oh, and I in like for some people that may just be a simple like math thing, like help more people, it'll be better. But I think the issue is a lot of people see don't see black people as diverse of a people as we actually are. Like even within this Zoom call, you know, I'm, you know, I'm black American. I don't know where my ancestors my we're stolen people, so I don't know where I'm from. But Katie's Jamaican and you you're Creole and like all of this. There's just so much culture um within black people we're an entire diaspora um and a lot of people don't see our our versatility and our um diversity um within that and so i think it's really important for us to create something that is very pointedly and, and explicitly um for black people to um kind of cater to that because i feel like we are the only people um who are who are paying enough attention to our own nuances, you know? Um, and that's not to say that there are, there are not other people under that umbrella of people of color that, that deserve that. I absolutely think they do. And I absolutely um, uh, support any sort of um, initiative that is uh, comparable to ISBM or Classically Black that caters to, um, to any other um, group that identifies as, you know, indigenous or um, people of color, because the, I've actually been in conversations where, for example, a program that has a vast, vast majority Latino students, and they were like, well, how can we, you know, it, it's too many, and we, how do we bring black people in this? And it's so funny because people will ask me, of course, because I'm Delaney, and people know my reputation, they're like, Delaney, how do we do this? And I'm like, well, maybe we don't because y'all deserve that you do <laughs> you deserve to have your own your own space and um i'm doing a lot of work on behalf of black musicians um and it's not to say that we can't be in a space together because you know sphinx is a prime example of a space that we do have together um but i also want to make it known that there are those of us there are black people who are in support of your liberation as well and so and you and you deserve to have something that that explicitly caters to the the issues that your group faces that are unique to you because just like black people are not a monolith there's no other group of people that are a monolith and the 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 issue with the people of color moniker is that sometimes we get lumped together in in thinking that we are all facing the same struggle and we're not um and that can that can lead to vague, very vague solutions that are like blanket solutions that don't really necessarily pinpoint any of the actual problems. So it ignores that we have different issues and it also ignores that we have issues amongst ourselves that need to, uh, that need to be um, addressed because not all black people are, are, are safe or feel safe um, in, in company, even if it is all people of color because anti-blackness is global, it's all over the place. And it's not just white people engaging in it. So um, that that's another uh, another uh, conversation um, that definitely needs to be um, addressed because I think it's very important that um, 
we are are pro black in these spaces and, and classically black and ISBN, but it's also important that we um, acknowledge uh, the differences that we have with other people of color, um, but also stand in solidarity um, with with their liberation and um, and ask that they do the same. Yeah, I think when we when Delaney and I were planning uh, when Delaney and I were planning ISBM uh, last summer, um, it came out of a conversation of frustration because, like Delaney said, a lot of times in these first of all POC is a is a it's oftentimes in my experience a blanket term that is used to make white people more comfortable so instead of saying like black they'll say like oh poc but i'm like i'm black like just say like a person like, i am literally black just say black it's gonna be okay you know and it's out of a out of a place of frustration because black people's needs aren't met in these diversity spaces you know or black people are often left out um opportunities aren't there's opportunities don't go around and don't get to black people. So when we were thinking of ISBM, like, well, how can we have an organization that caters specifically to black people? And then also in the same breath to say, like, how do we champion black music? Because a lot of times um, we've seen, the thing I love about classical black is there's gonna be some type of crossover. Of course, that we talk about classical music. That's kind of like our main point of departure. It's, it's my main bag, you know, we're gonna talk about classical music. But I love so much when we have like crossover um, episodes we always talk about rap, always talk about gospel music, and we just like kind of turn it into some way. Sometimes it's sometimes it's a straight line, sometimes it's a, it's a reach back to uh, classical music because that's what people come to listen to us for. Um, but the thing I love about these conversations that we have on classically black is we talk about we talk about these other black musics and this with the same academic prowess and respect that we talk about classical music. And Delaney and I do that, but everybody don't do that. And it's kind of disheartening when you go and it's like, I grew up in a black church. I, I still go to church, you know what I'm saying? And like, I hear this amazing musicianship. I knew Do Re Mi Fa So before I even knew it was Do Re Mi Fa So. Like I was like, oh, this is, what, this is what it's called. When I got to undergrad, I was like, oh, this is what it's called. You know, and I knew great musicianship where my, where my, um, the music minister in my church will have no music in front of him, but he's playing in different keys and he's like, oh, just give me this key, period. You know, I grew up with that and I had to like, you sit down in the classroom, my music is not celebrated at all. I didn't talk about gospel once. I didn't talk about one black composer in my entire undergrad experience. I will say I did not go to a conservatory undergrad. I'm not gonna give, that's not an excuse, but I will say that a lot of my music went like this, music history, because I had to take math and economics um but yeah but that's still not that's still not an excuse but I, that is a, that is a reason um but i've never talked about um black music in any way in in and i went to a conservatory a comprehensive school of music that is not comprehensive at all you know so when we make a when we make a um an organization how do we center black music like let's talk about the music I grew up listening to, like, God, Saturday morning, every Sunday morning after church, there was reggae playing in my house. I never talked about that in music school, you know, but I'm supposed to be, like, a well-rounded musician, you know. So ISBM also makes that place um, for, for Black music, which is, has been really, really exciting. Um, and obviously, we're still in the, the growth phases of ISBM. Our network is classical musicians, but that's growing. So I'm excited to see how that ISBM is going to look in five and ten years when we finally can, when we can finally bridge away from our break away rather from our network. Our network is classical musicians, but when we start engaging with other musicians um, outside, it's just going to be really, really beautiful. Thing. Yeah, yeah. And the thing is, I wish um, other, well, just non-Black people of color understood is that once Black people are free, so will you. Because the root of so many things is anti-Blackness, you know? We really are truly all in it together, but so many non-Black people of color do not understand that. And I completely agree, POC is a term used to make white people for more comfortable and not have to do the work. You know, someone from Cambodia is different from someone from China. You know, like within every group, there is something different, especially in our diaspora, you know, there in the South, it is very different. Um, if you are like from Mississippi or Alabama, 
than if you're from Louisiana. You know, cr being Creole is very different. Our music is very different. Everyone just thinks we're a food type, you know, food is pretty bomb, but it's not all we are. And especially with the music, I grew up with Zydeco. So um, it was very confusing to me when I started getting to, um, cause I went to state school for two years as well. And then transferred to so the music history in state school is really nothing. Like they, they really rushed through that in I think two semesters. So um, what's it called? When I got there and people always talked about accordion, they're like, the accordion is a dying instrument, blah, blah, blah. And I was like, no, you just don't know where it is. You know, it's in um, Banda and it's in Zydeco. I grew up with accordion. I was always like, I don't really know what this is. And the washerboard. And um, I mean, it's just music from our ancestors. Literally what the enslaved in Louisiana had is still happening today in Zydeco. And it's, it's just so... The diaspora is so strong because with um ooh, what is the music in the DR in Puerto Rico? Reggaeton? Marengue. Huh? Marengue. No, it's like the well the hip hop really in um in the in DR and everything. But um it really reminds me of Zydeco because they kind of like take one word or phrase and just really like turn it up. And in New Orleans and Louisiana, we have bounce music. And it's really, really, really similar in that way. You know, like we're all really so connected and our diaspora and that's not celebrated. And it's also the fact that in white spaces, non-black spaces, our music is an elective. While on one side, you can take a class to learn our music. On the other side, learning about our music is a choice. So that is the biggest thing. And there's people, well, I think Martin had just left, but all of the black faculty I've met at Evo um, have changed me, you know, just getting to know Martin, and I say this every time, but I, I compose in graphic scores. I don't really know that was like a thing thing, you know, um, if they incorporated non-Western music in music history, it would, that would have been fixed. But I met Matana and all of their art and music. And I was like, oh my God, like, where have you been? But the thing is, they've been here. We weren't there because we weren't shown. You know, all of these Black people, when they say underrepresented, no, we're here. You're choosing not to fucking see us. Like, we are not the problem. Um, when people are talking about like, wow, well, um, what's it called? How East Asian women are so over-sexualized, same with Latinx women, same with Black women. And it's like, well, maybe if you stop doing that, white people, in your media, because that's what you control, this would not happen so much. When I meet people that, um, international students that come over, and they are very honest about how they see Black people at first, and they're like, it's because it's all we saw on TV, you know? And it's just like, well, there's a common denominator here. It's like on My Big Fat Greek Wedding when the dad can trace everything back to um, Greek. You can trace everything back to the white man. So it just, in every art form, in every job force, in all of these institutions, there is in fact the common problem. That is not a secret that we all realize. But at the end of the day, Black people, we will be free, probably in none of our lifetimes. But eventually, and I feel like that is what is missed in activism is that it can get very self-centered and fight for one person instead of understanding really in activism, at least how I have understood it, we probably not gonna see this shit. But my little brother, hopefully he gets a glimpse and I'm planning on having five kids. So one of them is going to see it, you know, but that we're fighting for the future generations of musicians because my student Xavion, he's about to go to um, college in like a year. And I don't want him to be a double major. I mean, let's see he wants to like be a double major, but um, I want him just to be able to study. We deserve freedom in all spaces, in every space. Um, and to kind of correct something earlier that's in my bio, the Sound of African, di African Diaspora was once a competition. And then I realized like, oh no, this is fitting into the white system to where we have to just compete, 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 because that's how, it, how it's been. It's not just a commissioning project. Um, and to kind of, go into that and creating art with other Black musicians. I really wish Jesse could be here, but he got the second dose and yeah, they really took him out. So um, Jesse and I are working on a brand new concerto that's premiering this fall and it is amazing. And it's also giving me the biggest headache of my life. So, and it's just, and I'm so happy he's doing that because he wrote it in the way 
for bassoon that is it's just not out there yet and it's going it's going to change things he is such a genius he is super inspired by sun Ra. um he is just such a scholar he's at columbia university but currently in switzerland and it's just amazing everything he does and the way our process of working on his solo piece on form um, content negotiations was very different than anything I've ever had to workshop before because I got the score to this and actually I think Katie Delaney y'all saw the score or you saw the score to the concerto and both y'all were like (laughs) hold on like what is this Um, and it was a lot of math it was a lot of math I was overwhelmed I remember bringing this to Rebecca as well and I was like girl what the fuck are we gonna do about this you know like it was just so scary and a lot of times when I work with white composers on a new piece there's a lot of arrogance there's a lot of condescending nature um, and there's not really a lot of collaborating Um, there's so many language barriers there's a lot going on there and with Jesse I showed up and I was playing everything and he was like why is it so rigid and I was like nigga because you wrote it rigid you know like there was just so (laughs) so many rhythms and everything and I was like what do you want so then we improv it together and he was like this is what I want and I was like to do that you know and he was like oh you know there's just this way that we can communicate with each other that's so honest so real none of us have to code switch you know and it's just so fun and that's the beauty of just and it's not just black people I hope that when two Asian people get together, it's the same way, two indigenous, um, two Latinx, you know, I hope this is a similar experience because we all deserve that freedom in our own spaces to create our own art. Because there are too many white people writing in the style of Asian boys, you know, just completely appropriating. Same for us. There's too many people in Korea doing K-pop and completely ripping off from hip hop and not actually just trying to collaborate. You know, there's, there's so much stealing in every direction instead of just collaborating together you know and that's the problem so with this new concerto from jesse it's tiled um a practice and breathing together um and it is just so beautiful i have to play the bassoon in a way i've never had to play before in my life um i have never had to play so high and play the bassoon and play a reed on the side of my mouth at the same time um so this is an example of me and jesse's playing together and I only have one regret about this is that um, when we did this, I did not think to have us both in the video, just a video production thing, but um, this was filmed and recorded by the one and only Ross Carr um, at um, the ensemble's house. And it was recorded in October and Jesse, um, with his solo piece, when we started workshopping it together with improving. Um, we both realized like, oh, wait, this can like, this piece can be in so many different ways. So that's just another level of creativity. There's this level of, I've used the word a lot, but a freedom to just grow and take it in any direction and trust. And that's what I really felt from Jesse, that he really trusts me with my artistic process. And I can kind of do whatever with this piece. If me, Kate and Delaney, a bassist and a violist got together, we could play this piece. We should do it. So, you know, and, and all of these things. So this is Jesse and I performing together, um, but while he was in Switzerland via Jam Kazam.
Yeah, it was just so fun getting to do that with him. Like, I've never felt so free. That's the theme of today, freedom. Obviously, it was in the title, but um, it it was truly a life changing experience for me. And through this program as well, um, you know, I, I give the ensemble a lot of shit. So I'm gonna, you know, we're gonna change that up a little bit today. Um, through this program, I've learned so much about. Um, myself and improvisation and that is really one of the best parts I think of this program is the freedom and the way the curriculum is set to each of the participants can really grow as an improviser online as well but especially when we were in person on the in the high altitude of fam but um and I learned so much about listening I've learned so much about freedom and creativity but most again listening and what I've learned in Black spaces of improvisation, because we had um, this really silly name, it was like Black Moon at Noon in Banff, where all the Black people at Banff got together and we were improvising. Um, and it was just very different to when we improvise together as a large group, everyone else, because in the real world where white people don't listen to us very often, you know, and try to talk over and just interrupt and all these things, a lot of white improvisers do that while playing, you know, um, art imitates life. So it was very frustrating and very telling to me how even in every space, it's going to be different with the makeup of people, obviously. But I never thought it would be so deep as into such an emotional and intimate place of improvisation. So it, freedom is just so important. And, you know, I'll kind of wrap up that little section with that, but just to kind of point out when you give people representation of what they would like, and you know, it will really open a lot of creative doors for them. It will let them just be a lot more relaxed um, and a lot of things like that. And you know, the first year I went to Science Evolution, there was only two black participants and it was not the best time, but they listened to what I said and there was a lot more of us the next year and I just had such a better time, you know? It mean it really impacts when you just have people there that look like you in every way. And then I look at the people here, there's even more, you know, it's a really great thing um, when these spaces are listening to the people that they work with. Love y'all. Um, and it just is really fun to get to be in a space that has a lot of problems, you know, contemporary music, um, classical music, all of these spaces have so much racism and everything, but then they start to decolonize our own space. You know, this ensemble has a long way to go the same way that um, LA Phil has a long way to go. And LA Phil is doing, I think, a really great job right now with especially their um, season just getting announced. So, but in the meantime of them reaching this never ending process of nirvana of anti-racism, um, they are bringing a lot of people along the way and making this a much more comfortable space for us to be around. And many, many, many spaces need to do this that wasp just grabbed up y'all i'm in florida at this residency and a wasp just like grabbed a lizard this is jurassic park so um it's but that's the thing and like with institutions like this no group should be the model because like this group i mean la phil they are all rooted in white supremacy you know it is, is what it is because it was founded by white people um but can still do the right thing and make this a nonviolent space for Black people, for Latinx people, for Indigenous people to come and have freedom within, you know, kind of. And I think that's something that white institutions can do is put money in spaces, kind of, I don't wanna say create the space, but create the opportunity for us to create the space under the funding, you know, and not hold it over because a lot of times these institutions will create this space or this fellowship or something like that and be like well here you go like you're welcome okay now go do your thing we are not going to really support you anytime you leave after this so la phil international ensemble um and many others like i hope more people take note of the work that's being done and can just start to support black people much 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 more um you know but every group definitely has a long way to go so, but to kind of wrap up this talk, I wanted to ask you to one last question about representation um, and then ask about, you know, your future goals and your current projects. Um, so New York Phil, 
um, in 2019, I believe it was 2019, they released that they were doing a um, commissioning project for women. Um, and it was mostly white women, I believe one East Asian woman um, and two black women. And at what point is this, like, how do you two feel, you know, when you see things like this in these spaces that are quote unquote, trying to do better, but still they don't understand the fundamental that even if you're supporting white women, you're still supporting white supremacy. I think for me, what I realized on um, past couple of months is that white people simply cannot do the work for some of, some of the things cannot be done by white people. And it's difficult because a lot of these organizations are ran by white people. So it's, it's, um, it's tough because I feel like we're gonna continue to see the same stuff until organizations realize that because there's no, there's no way that the people from coming from a place of privilege and fr quite frankly, the, the oppressors can really justify the people that they have oppressed. So that's kind of like my take on it. I don't know, I mean, I'm sure we'll see a shift with when we have more Black people not only in the room, but making decisions. But I just don't believe that white people can truly do this work. I, I, I don't. I mean, in a, in a, in a holistic way. Um, so that's, that's kind of like my, that, my take on it. So we'll continue to see um, a diversity project with one Black person and everybody else is um, white and from Mexico or something like that. You know what I'm saying? Like we're always like slightly missing the mark. Um, but that's, that's my um, opinion on that. Yeah, I feel like, I feel like a lot of places will take women's issues, especially as sort of, um, and think they're kind of like covering a lot of bases by, um, by addressing those issues, but like, gender issues are literally like inseparable from race because they our issues we may have gender issues as black women and white women have gender issues as well but they're different like um they're actually pretty opposite like we're usually um seen as you know like like strong and like like we can handle a lot and um and like over masculine and like you know things like that a lot of things are put upon black women where for a lot of white women it's the exact opposite is they're seen as weak or like whatever those are the the struggles that we have in terms of our relationship with um with men and um just gender issues in in general so to to do like a blanket project and and um hire mostly white women and call that representation i mean i just got to be completely clear i don't feel represented by white women because it, like I'm, I'm just not our issues are not the same we don't uh face the same thing so i feel like um it's important that we make that clear and then it's also and, and the same goes for like you said they had one east asian woman woman um their relationship with gender issues is different from ours, is different from white women, is different from Latinas. Like it's, we all, again, are just like so nuanced. And I think that um, the the execution of, of things like that definitely depends on, like Katie said, having um, the actual work being done by, I guess, a variety of people, because like we said, black people shouldn't have to do the work, but it, in a lot of cases, there are black people who would like to uh, do the work and, and they deserve to to be uh, included in that and also compensated um, generously for that. Yeah, we are old billions, trillions, reparations need to happen yesterday. Um, and no, I feel very similarly because like I've been seeing a lot more representation of pride this year. Uh, but again, after the year of hashtag BLM, so many things have fallen flat. And, you know, as being trans non-binary femme, it is really sad that in Pride, you still don't see a lot of representation of Black trans people, Black non-binary people, Black queer people. Um, so it's, it's really terrible that in these institutions, they think we'll put a white woman, we'll put a white trans woman, a white non-binary person, 
um, and thinking like that's really doing something like these people still are not very and have the capability of being extremely, extremely racist. So um, yeah, with that, um, everyone go out there and do the work. But I want to thank you two so, so much for joining me today. And I would love if you put your Instagrams, um, ways people keep in contact with you in the chat. Um, and maybe we can do questions for like five minutes. Does that sound good? Yeah, and I'm just going to quickly say goodbye to those who are tuning in on YouTube so we can um, 